Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future by Father Seraphim Rose. Chapter 7. The quote, Charismatic Revival as a Sign of the Times. Costa Deer took the mic and told us how his heart was burdened for the Greek Orthodox Church. He asked Episcopalian Father Driscoll to pray that the Holy Spirit would sweep that church as he was sweeping the Catholic Church. While Father Driscoll prayed, Costa Deer wept into the mic. Following the prayer was a long message in tongues and an equally long interpretation, saying that the prayers had been heard and the Holy Spirit would blow through and awaken the Greek Orthodox Church. By this time there was so much weeping and calling out that I backed away from it all emotionally. Yet I heard myself saying a surprising thing, quote, Some day when we read how the Spirit is moving in the Greek Orthodox Church, let us remember that we were here the moment that it began." End quote. Six months after the event here described occurred at an interdenominational, quote, charismatic meeting in Seattle, Orthodox Christians did indeed begin to hear that the, quote, charismatic spirit was moving in the Greek Orthodox Church. Beginning in January 1972, Father Eusebius Stephanus Logos began to report on this movement, which had begun earlier in several Greek and Syrian parishes in America and now had spread to a number of others, being actively promoted by Father Eusebius. After the reader has read the description of this, quote, spirit, from the words of its leading representatives in the pages that follow, he should not find it difficult to believe that in very fact it was evoked and instilled into the Orthodox world by just such urgent entreaties of, quote, interdenominational Christians. For if one conclusion emerges from this description, it must certainly be that the spectacular present-day, quote, charismatic revival is not merely a phenomenon of hyper-emotionalism and Protestant revivalism, although these elements are also strongly present, but is actually the work of a, quote, spirit who can be invoked and works, quote, miracles. The question we shall attempt to answer in these pages is, who or what is this spirit? As Orthodox Christians, we know that it is not only God who works miracles. The devil has his own, quote, miracles, and in fact he can and does imitate virtually every genuine miracle of God. We shall therefore attempt in these pages to be careful to try the spirits, whether they are of God. 1 John 4.1 we shall begin with a brief historical background, since no one can deny that the quote charismatic revival has come to the Orthodox world from the Protestant and Catholic denominations, which in turn received it from the Pentecostal sects. Number 1. The 20th Century Pentecostal Movement The modern Pentecostal movement, although it did have 19th century antecedents, dates its origin precisely to 7 p.m. on New Year's Eve of the year 1900. For some time before that moment, a Methodist minister in Topeka, Kansas, Charles Parham, as an answer to the confessed feebleness of his Christian ministry, had been concentratedly studying the New Testament with a group of his students with the aim of discovering the secret of the power of apostolic Christianity. The students finally deduced that this secret lay in the quote, speaking in tongues, which, they thought, always accompanied the reception of the Holy Spirit in the Acts of the Apostles. With increasing excitement and tension, Parham and his students resolved to pray until they themselves received the quote, baptism of the Holy Spirit, together with speaking in tongues. On December 31, 1900, they prayed from morning to night with no success, until one young girl suggested that one ingredient was missing in this experiment, quote, laying on of hands. Parham put his hands on the young girl's head, and immediately she began to speak in an, quote, unknown tongue. 
Within three days, there were many such, quote, baptisms, including that of Parham himself and twelve other ministers of various denominations, and all of them were accompanied by speaking in tongues. Soon the revival spread to Texas, and then it had spectacular success at a small black church in Los Angeles. Since then, it has spread throughout the world and claims 10 million members. For half a century, the Pentecostal movement remained sectarian, and everywhere it was received with hostility by the established denominations. Then, however, speaking in tongues began gradually to appear in the denominations themselves, although at first it was kept rather quiet, until in 1960 an Episcopalian priest near Los Angeles gave wide publicity to this fact by publicly declaring that he had received the quote, baptism of the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues. After some initial hostility, the quote, charismatic revival gained the official or unofficial approval of all the major denominations and has spread rapidly both in America and abroad. Even the once rigid and exclusivist Roman Catholic Church, once it took up the quote, charismatic renewal in earnest in the late 1960s, has been enthusiastically swept up in this movement. In America, the Roman Catholic bishops gave their approval to the movement in 1969, and the few thousand Catholics involved in it then have since increased to untold hundreds of thousands, who gather periodically in local and nationwide, quote, charismatic conferences, whose participants are sometimes numbered in the tens of thousands. The Roman Catholic countries of Europe have also become enthusiastically charismatic, as witnessed by the charismatic conference in the summer 1978 in Ireland, attended by thousands of Irish priests. Not long before his death, Pope Paul VI met with a delegation of charismatics and proclaimed that he too is Pentecostal. What can be the reason for such a spectacular success of a, quote, Christian revival in a seemingly post-Christian world? Doubtless the answer lies in two factors. First, the receptive ground which consists of those millions of, quote, Christians who feel that their religion is dry, over-rational, merely external, without fervency or power. And second, the evidently powerful, quote, spirit that lies behind the phenomena, which is capable, under the proper conditions, of producing a multitude and variety of charismatic phenomena, including healing, speaking in tongues, interpretation, prophecy, and, underlying all of these, an overwhelming experience which is called the, quote, baptism of, or in, or with, the Holy Spirit. But what precisely is this, quote, spirit? Significantly, this question is seldom, if ever, raised by followers of the charismatic revival. Their own, quote, baptismal experience is so powerful and has been preceded by such an effective psychological preparation in the form of concentrated prayer and expectation that there is never any doubt in their minds but that they have received the Holy Spirit and that the phenomena they have experienced and seen are exactly those described in the Acts of the Apostles. Also, the psychological atmosphere of the movement is often so one-sided and tense that it is regarded as the very blasphemy against the Holy Spirit to entertain any doubts in this regard. Of the hundreds of books that have already appeared on the movement, only a very few express even slight doubts as to its spiritual validity. In order to obtain a better idea of the distinctive characteristics of the quote, charismatic revival, let us examine some of the testimonies and practices of its participants, always checking them against the standard of holy orthodoxy. These testimonies will be taken, with a few exceptions as noted, from the apologetical books and magazines of the movement. 
written by people who are favorable to it, and who obviously publish only that material which seems to support their position. Further, we shall make only minimal use of narrowly Pentecostal sources, confining ourselves chiefly to Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox participants in the contemporary charismatic revival. Number two, the quote, ecumenical spirit of the quote, charismatic revival. Before quoting the charismatic testimonies, we should take note of a chief characteristic of the original Pentecostal movement, which is seldom mentioned by charismatic writers, and that is that the number and variety of Pentecostal sects is astonishing, each with its own doctrinal emphasis, and many of them having no fellowship with the others. There are, quote, assemblies of God, churches of God, Pentecostal, and holiness bodies, full gospel groups, etc., many of them divided into smaller sects. The first thing that one would have to say about the, quote, spirit that inspires such anarchy is that it certainly is not a spirit of unity, in sharp contrast to the apostolic church of the first century to which the movement professes to be returning. Nevertheless, there is much talk, especially in the charismatic revival, within the denominations in the past decade of the unity which it inspires. But what kind of unity is this? The true unity of the church which Orthodox Christians of the 1st and 20th centuries alike know, or the pseudo-unity of the ecumenical movement, which denies that the Church of Christ exists. The answer to this question is stated quite clearly by perhaps the leading, quote, prophet of 20th century Pentecostalism, David Du Plessis, who for the last 20 years has been actively spreading news of the, quote, baptism of the Holy Spirit among the denominations of the World Council of Churches in answer to a, quote, voice which commanded him to do so in 1951. Quote, the Pentecostal revival within the churches is gathering force and speed. The most remarkable thing is that this revival is found in the so-called liberal societies and much less in the evangelical and not at all in the fundamentalist segments of Protestantism. The last mentioned are now the most vehement opponents of this glorious revival because it is in the Pentecostal movement and in the modernist world council movements that we find the most powerful manifestations of the spirit. Duplice, page 28. In the Roman Catholic Church, likewise, the charismatic renewal is occurring precisely in, quote, liberal circles, and one of its results is to inspire even more their ecumenism and liturgical experimentation, quote, guitar masses and the like. Whereas traditionalist Catholics are as opposed to the movement as are fundamentalist Protestants, without any doubt, the orientation of the charismatic revival is strongly ecumenist. A charismatic Lutheran pastor, Clarence Finassas, writes, quote, Many are surprised that the Holy Spirit can move also in the various traditions of the historic church, whether the church doctrine has a background of Calvinism or Armenianism, this matters little. Proving God is bigger than our creeds, and that no denomination has a monopoly on him." End quote. Christensen, page 99. An Episcopalian pastor, speaking of the charismatic revival, reports that, quote, ecumenically, it is leading to a remarkable joining together of Christians of different traditions, mainly at the local church level. Harper, page 17. The California charismatic periodical, Interchurch Renewal, is full of, quote, unity demonstrations such as this one, quote, the darkness of the ages was dispelled, and a Roman Catholic nun and a Protestant could love each other with a strange new kind of love, which proves that, quote, old denominational barriers are crumbling. 
superficial doctrinal differences are being put aside for all believers to come into the unity of the Holy Spirit, end quote. The Orthodox priest Father Eusebius Stephanou believes that, quote, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit is transcending denominational lines. The Spirit of God is moving, both inside and outside the Orthodox Church, end quote. Logos, January 1972, page 12. Here, the Orthodox Christian who is alert to, quote, try the spirits, finds himself on familiar ground, sown with the usual ecumenist cliches. And above all, let us note that this new, quote, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, exactly like the ecumenical movement itself, arises outside the Orthodox Church. Those few Orthodox parishes that are now taking it up are obviously following a fashion of the times that matured completely outside the bounds of the Church of Christ. But what is it that those outside the Church of Christ are capable of teaching Orthodox Christians? It is certainly true, no conscious Orthodox person will deny it, that Orthodox Christians are sometimes put to shame by the fervor and zeal of some Roman Catholics and Protestants for church attendance, missionary activities, praying together, reading the scripture, and the like. Fervent non-Orthodox persons can shame the Orthodox, even in the error of their beliefs, when they make more effort to please God than many Orthodox people do while possessing the whole fullness of apostolic Christianity. The Orthodox would do well to learn from them and wake up to the spiritual riches in their own church, which they fail to see out of spiritual sloth or bad habits. All this relates to the human side of faith, to the human efforts which can be expended in religious activities, whether one's belief is right or wrong. The quote, charismatic movement, however, claims to be in contact with God, to have found a means for receiving the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of God's grace. And yet it is precisely the church, and nothing else, that our Lord Jesus Christ established as the means of communicating grace to men. Are we to believe that the church is now to be superseded by some, quote, new revelation, capable of transmitting grace outside the church? Among any group of people who may happen to believe in Christ, but who have no knowledge or experience of the mysteries, sacraments, which Christ instituted, and no contact with the apostles and their successors, whom he appointed to administer the mysteries? No. It is as certain today as it was in the first century that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are not revealed in those outside the church. The great Orthodox father of the 19th century, Bishop Theophan the Recluse, writes that the gift of the Holy Spirit is given, quote, precisely through the sacrament of chrismation, which was introduced by the apostles in place of the laying of the hands, end quote which is the form the sacrament takes in the Acts of the Apostles. Quote, We all who have been baptized and chrismated have the gift of the Holy Spirit, even though it is not active in everyone. End quote. The Orthodox Church provides the means for making this gift active. And, quote, There is no other path without the sacrament of chrismation, just as earlier without the laying on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Spirit has never descended and will never descend." End quote. In a word, the orientation of the charismatic revival may be described as one of a newer and deeper or, quote, spiritual ecumenism. Each Christian, quote, renewed in his own tradition, but at the same time strangely united, for it is the same experience, with others equally, quote, renewed in their own traditions, all of which contain various degrees of heresy and impiety. 
this relativism leads also to openness to completely new religious practices, as when an orthodox priest allows laymen to, quote, lay hands on him in front of the royal doors of an orthodox church. Logos, April 1972, page 4. The end of all this is the super ecumenist vision of the leading Pentecostal, quote, prophet, who says that many Pentecostals, quote, begin to visualize the possibility of the movement becoming the Church of Christ in the closing days of time. However, this situation has completely changed during the past 10 years. Many of my brethren are now convinced that the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, will pour out his spirit upon all flesh and that the historic churches will be revived or renewed and then in this renewal be united by the Holy Spirit." End quote. Duplessis, page 33. Clearly, there is no room in the charismatic revival for those who believe that the Orthodox Church is the Church of Christ. It is no wonder that even some Orthodox Pentecostals admit that in the beginning they were, quote, suspicious of the orthodoxy of this movement. Logos, April 1972, page 9. But now let us begin to look beyond the ecumenistic theories and practices of Pentecostalism to that which really inspires and gives strength to the quote charismatic revival, the actual experience of the power of the quote spirit. Number three, speaking in tongues. If we look carefully at the writings of the charismatic revival, we shall find that this movement closely resembles many sectarian movements of the past in basing itself primarily or even entirely on one rather bizarre doctrinal emphasis or religious practice. The only difference is that the emphasis is now placed on a specific point which no sectarians in the past regarded as so central, speaking in tongues. According to the constitution of various Pentecostal sects, quote, the baptism of believers in the Holy Ghost is witnessed by the initial physical sign of speaking with other tongues, end quote. Cheryl, page 79. And not only is this the first sign of conversion to a Pentecostal sect or orientation, according to the best Pentecostal authorities, this practice must be continued or the, quote, spirit may be lost. Writes David Duplessis, quote, The practice of praying in tongues should continue and increase in the lives of those who are baptized in the spirit. Otherwise, they may find that other manifestations of the spirit come seldom or stop altogether, end quote. Duplessis, page 89. Many testify, as does one Protestant, that tongues, quote, have now become an essential accompaniment to my devotional life. Lily, page 50. And a Roman Catholic book on the subject, more cautiously, says that of the, quote, gifts of the Holy Spirit, tongues, quote, is often but not always the first received. For many, it is thus a threshold through which one passes into the realm of gifts and fruits of the Holy Spirit, end quote. Ran again, page 19. Here already, one may note an overemphasis that is certainly not present in the New Testament, where speaking in tongues has a decidedly minor significance, serving as a sign of the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, and on two other occasions, Acts 10 and 19. After the first or perhaps the second century, there is no record of it in any orthodox source, and it is not recorded as occurring even among the great fathers of the Egyptian desert, who were so filled with the Spirit of God that they performed numerous astonishing miracles, including raising the dead. The orthodox attitude to genuine speaking in tongues, then, may be summed up in the words of blessed Augustine. Homilies on John, 
6.10, quote, In the earliest times the Holy Spirit fell upon them that believed, and they spake with tongues which they had not learned, as the Spirit gave them utterance. These were signs adapted to the time, for it was fitting that there be this sign of the Holy Spirit in all tongues to show that the gospel of God was to run through all tongues over the whole earth. That was done for a sign, and it passed away." End quote. And as if to answer contemporary Pentecostals with their strange emphasis on this point, Augustine continues, quote, is it now expected that they upon whom hands are laid should speak with tongues? Or when we imposed our hand upon these children, did each of you wait to see whether they would speak with tongues? And when he saw that they did not speak with tongues, was any of you so perverse of heart as to say, these have not received the Holy Spirit? End quote. Modern Pentecostals, to justify their use of tongues, refer most of all to St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, chapters 12 through 14. But St. Paul wrote this passage precisely because, quote, tongues had become a source of disorder in the church of Corinth, and even while he does not forbid them, he decidedly minimizes their significance. This passage, therefore, far from encouraging any modern revival of, quote, tongues, should on the contrary discourage it, especially when one discovers, as Pentecostals themselves admit, that there are other sources of speaking in tongues besides the Holy Spirit. As Orthodox Christians, we already know that speaking in tongues as a true gift of the Holy Spirit cannot appear among those outside the Church of Christ. But let us look more closely at this modern phenomenon and see if it possesses characteristics that might reveal from what source it does come. If we are already made suspicious by the exaggerated importance accorded to quote tongues by modern Pentecostals, we should be completely awakened about them when we examine the circumstances in which they occur. Far from being given freely and spontaneously, without man's interference, as are the true gifts of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues can be caused to occur quite predictably by a regular technique of concentrated group, quote, prayer, accompanied by psychologically suggestive Protestant hymns, quote, he comes, he comes, culminating in a, quote, laying on of hands and sometimes involving such purely physical efforts as repeating a given phrase over and over again, Coke, page 24, or just making sounds with the mouth. One person admits that, like many others, after speaking in tongues, quote, I often did mouth nonsense syllables in an effort to start the flow of prayers in tongues, end quote. Cheryl, page 127, and such efforts, far from being discouraged, are actually advocated by Pentecostals. Quote, making sounds with the mouth is not speaking in tongues, but it may signify an honest act of faith, which the Holy Spirit will honor by giving that person the power to speak in another language. End quote. Harper, page 11. Another Protestant pastor says, quote, The initial hurdle to speaking in tongues, it seems, is simply the realization that you must speak forth. The first syllables and words may sound strange to your ear. They may be halting and inarticulate. You may have the thought that you are just making it up. But as you continue to speak in faith, the Spirit will shape for you a language of prayer and praise, end quote. Christensen, page 130. A Jesuit, quote, theologian tells how he put such advice into practice. After breakfast, I felt almost physically drawn to the chapel where I sat down to pray. Following Jim's description of his own reception of the gift of tongues, I began quietly to myself, La, 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 
To my immense consternation, there ensued a rapid movement of tongue and lips, accompanied by a tremendous feeling of inner devotion. Jelpi, page 1. Can any sober Orthodox Christian possibly confuse these dangerous psychic games with the gifts of the Holy Spirit? There is clearly nothing whatever Christian, nothing spiritual here in the least. This is the realm, rather, of psychic mechanisms which can be set in operation by means of definite psychological or physical techniques, and speaking in tongues would seem to occupy a key role as a kind of, quote, trigger in this realm. In any case, it certainly bears no resemblance whatever to the spiritual gift described in the New Testament, and if anything, is much closer to shamanistic, quote, speaking in tongues, as practiced in primitive religions, where the shaman or witch doctor has a regular technique for going into a trance and then giving a message to or from a, quote, God in a tongue he has not learned. In the pages that follow, we shall encounter, quote, charismatic experiences so weird that the comparison with shamanism will not seem terribly far-fetched, especially if we understand that primitive shamanism is but a particular expression of a, quote, religious phenomenon which, far from being foreign to the modern West, actually plays a significant role in the lives of some contemporary, quote, Christians, mediumism. Number four, quote, Christian mediumism. One careful and objective study of speaking in tongues has been made by the German Lutheran pastor, Dr. Kurt Koch, The Strife of Tongues. After examining hundreds of examples of this, quote, gift, as manifested in the past few years, he came to the conclusion, on scriptural grounds, that only four of these cases might be the same as the gift described in the Acts of the Apostles, but he was not sure of any of them. The Orthodox Christian, having the full patristic tradition of the Church of Christ behind him, would be more strict in his judgment than Dr. Koch. As against these few possibly positive cases, however, Dr. Koch found a number of cases of undoubted demonic possession, for, quote, speaking in tongues is in fact a common, quote, gift of the possessed. But it is in Dr. Koch's final conclusion that we find what is perhaps the clue to the whole movement. He concludes that the, quote, tongues movement is not at all a, quote, revival, for there is in it little repentance or conviction of sin, but chiefly the search for power and experience. The phenomenon of tongues is not the gift described in the Acts, nor is it, in most cases, actual demonic possession. Rather, quote, it becomes more and more clear that perhaps over 95% of the whole tongues movement is mediumistic in character. Koch, page 35. What is a, quote, medium? A medium is a person with a certain psychic sensitivity which enables him to be the vehicle or means for the manifestation of unseen forces or beings where actual beings are involved, as Starrett's Ambrose of Optina has clearly stated. These are always the fallen spirit whose realm this is, and not the, quote, spirits of the dead imagined by spiritists. Almost all non-Christian religions make large use of mediumistic gifts, such as clairvoyance, hypnosis, quote, miraculous healing, the appearance and disappearance of objects, as well as their movement from place to place, etc. It should be noted that several similar gifts have also been possessed by Orthodox saints, but there is an immense difference between the true Christian gift and its mediumistic imitation. The true Christian gift of healing, for example, is given by God directly in answer to fervent prayer, and especially at the prayer of a man who is particularly pleasing to God, a righteous man or saint. 
James 5.16, and also through contact in faith with objects which have been sanctified by God, holy water, relics of saints, etc. See Acts 19.12, 2 Kings 13.21. But mediumistic healing, like any other mediumistic gift, is accomplished by means of certain definite techniques and psychic states, which can be cultivated and brought into use by practice, and which have no relation whatever either to sanctity or to the action of God. The mediumistic ability may be acquired either by inheritance or by transference through contact with someone who has the gift or even through the reading of occult books. Many mediums claim that their powers are not at all supernatural, but come from a part of nature about which very little is known. To some extent this is doubtless true, but it is also true that the realm from which these gifts come is the special realm of the fallen spirits, who do not hesitate to use the opportunity afforded by the people who enter into this realm to draw them into their own nets, adding their own demonic powers and manifestations in order to lead souls to destruction. And whatever the explanation of various mediumistic phenomena may be, God in his revelation to mankind has strictly forbidden any contact with this occult realm. There shall not be found among you any one that useth divination, one that practiseth augury, or an enchanter, or a sorcerer, or a charmer, or a consulter with a familiar spirit, or a necromancer. For whosoever doeth these things is an abomination unto the Lord. Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 12. See also Leviticus 26. In practice, it is impossible to combine mediumism with genuine Christianity. The desire for mediumistic phenomena or powers being incompatible with basic Christian orientation toward the salvation of the soul. This is not to say that there are not, quote, Christians who are involved with mediumism, often unconsciously, as we shall see. It is only to say that they are not genuine Christians, that their Christianity is only a, quote, new Christianity, such as the one Nicholas Berdiev preached, which will be discussed again below. Dr. Koch, even from his Protestant background, makes a valid observation when he notes, quote, a person's religious life is not harmed by occultism or spiritism. Indeed, spiritism is to a large extent a, quote, religious movement. The devil does not take away our religiousness, but there is a great difference between being religious and being born again by the Spirit of God. It is sad to say that our Christian denominations have more, quote, religious people in them than true Christians, end quote. The best known form of mediumism in the modern West is the spiritistic seance, where contact is made with certain forces that produce observable effects such as knockings, voices, various kinds of communications such as automatic writing and speaking in unknown tongues, the moving of objects, and the apparition of hands and quote human figures that can sometimes be photographed. These effects are produced with the aid of definite attitudes and techniques on the part of those present, concerning which we shall hear quote one of the standard textbooks on the subject. Number one, passivity. Quote, a spirit's activity is measured by the degree of passivity or submissiveness which he finds in the sensitive or medium. Quote, mediumship by diligent cultivation which may be attained by anyone who deliberately yields up his body with his free will and sensitive and intellectual faculties to an invading or controlling spirit." End quote. Number two, solidarity in faith. All present must have a quote, sympathetic attitude of mind in support of the medium, end quote. The spiritistic phenomena are, quote, facilitated by certain sympathy arising from a harmony of ideas, 
views, and sentiment existing between the experimenters and the medium. When this sympathy and harmony, as well as the personal surrender of the will, are wanting in the members of the circle, the seance proves a failure. Also, the number of experimenters is of great importance. If larger, they impede the harmony so necessary for success." End quote. Number three, all present, quote, join hands to form the so-called magnetic circle. By this closed circuit, each member contributes the energy of a certain force which is collectively communicated to the medium, end quote. However, the magnetic circle is required only in less well-developed mediums. M. Blavatsky, the founder of modern, quote, theosophy, herself a medium, later laughed at the crude techniques of spiritism when she encountered much more powerful mediums in the East, to which category also belongs the fakir described in chapter 3. Number 4. Quote, the necessary spiritistic atmosphere is commonly induced by artificial means, such as the singing of hymns, the playing of soft music, and even the offering of prayer. End quote. The spiritistic seance, to be sure, is a rather crude form of mediumism, although for that very reason its techniques are all the more evident, and only rarely does it produce spectacular results. There are other more subtle forms, some of them going under the name of, quote, Christian. To realize this, one need only to look at the techniques of a, quote, faith healer, such as Oral Roberts, who until joining the Methodist Church a few years ago was a minister of the Pentecostal Holiness sect, who causes, quote, miraculous healings by forming an actual magnetic circle, composed of people with the proper sympathy, passivity, and harmony of faith, who put their hands on the television set while he is on the air. The healings can even be brought about by drinking a glass of water that has been placed on the television set and has thus absorbed the flow of mediumistic forces that have been brought into action. But such healings, like those produced by spiritism and witchcraft, can take a heavy toll in later psychic, not to mention spiritual, disorders. In this realm, one must be very careful, because the devil is constantly aping the works of God, and many people with mediumistic gifts continue to think they are Christians, and that their gifts come from the Holy Spirit. But is it possible to say that this is true of the charismatic revival? that it is in fact, as some say, primarily a form of mediumism? In applying the most obvious tests for mediumism to the charismatic revival, one is struck first of all by the fact that the chief prerequisites for the spiritistic seance described above are all present at charismatic prayer meetings whereas not one of these characteristics is present in the same form or degree in the true Christian worship of the Orthodox Church. 1. The, quote, passivity of the spiritistic seance corresponds to what charismatic writers call, quote, a kind of letting go. This involves more than the dedication of one's conscious existence through an act of will. It also refers to a large, even hidden area of one's unconscious life. All that can be done is to offer the self, body, mind, and even the tongue, so that the Spirit of God may have full possession. Such persons are ready. The barriers are down, and God moves mightily upon and through their whole being." End quote. Williams, pages 62 through 63 italics in the original. Such a, quote, spiritual attitude is not that of Christianity. It is rather the attitude of Zen Buddhism, Eastern mysticism, hypnosis, and spiritism. Such an exaggerated passivity is entirely foreign to orthodox spirituality, and is only an open invitation to the activity of deceiving spirits. One sympathetic observer notes that at Pentecostal meetings, people speaking in tongues or interpreting, quote, seem almost to go into a trance, 
Cheryl, page 87. This passivity is so pronounced in some charismatic communities that they completely abolish the church organization and any set order of services and do absolutely everything as the quote spirit directs. 2. There is a definite quote solidarity in faith. And not merely solidarity in Christian faith and hope for salvation, but a specific unanimity in the desire for and expectation of charismatic phenomena. This is true of all charismatic prayer meetings, but an even more pronounced solidarity is required for the experience of the quote, baptism of the Holy Spirit which is usually performed in a small separate room in the presence of only a few who have already had the experience. The presence of even one person who has negative thoughts about the experience is often sufficient to cause the, quote, baptism not to occur, exactly in the way that the misgivings and the prayer of the Orthodox priest described above, pages 34-35, was enough to break up the impressive illusion produced by the Salonese fakir. 3. The spiritistic magnetic circle corresponds to the Pentecostal laying on of the hands, which is always done by those who themselves have already experienced the quote baptism with speaking in tongues and who serve, in the words of Pentecostals themselves, as quote channels of the Holy Spirit. Williams, page 64, a word used by spiritists to refer to mediums. Number four, the quote charismatic, like the spiritistic atmosphere, is induced by means of suggestive hymns and prayers, and often also by hand clapping, all of which give quote, an effect of mounting excitement and almost intoxicating quality. Cheryl, page 23. It may still be objected that all those similarities between mediumism and Pentecostalism are only coincidental, and indeed, in order to show whether or not the charismatic revival is actually mediumistic, we shall have to determine what kind of spirit it is that is communicated through the Pentecostal, quote, channels. A number of testimonies by those who have experienced it, and who believe that it is the Holy Spirit, point clearly to its nature. Quote, the group moved closer around me. It was as if they were forming with their bodies a funnel through which was concentrated the flow of the spirit that was pulsing through the room. It flowed into me as I sat there. Cheryl, page 122. At a Catholic Pentecostal prayer meeting, quote, Upon entering a room, one was practically struck dead by the strong visible presence of God. Ranagan, page 79. Compare the quote, vibrant atmosphere at some pagan and Hindu rites. See above, page 17. Another man describes his baptismal experience. I became aware that the Lord was in the room and that he was approaching me. I couldn't see him, but I felt myself being pushed over on my back. I seemed to float to the floor. End quote. Logos Journal, November through December, 1971, page 47. Other similar examples will be given below in the discussion of the physical accompaniments of charismatic experience, this pulsing, visible, pushing spirit that approaches and flows would seem to confirm the mediumistic character of the charismatic movement. Certainly the Holy Spirit could never be described in these ways. And let us recall a strange characteristic of charismatic speaking in tongues that we have already mentioned, that it is given not only at the initial experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it is supposed to be continued both in private and public, and become a quote, essential accompaniment of religious life, or else the quote, gifts of the Spirit may cease. One Presbyterian charismatic, 
writer, speaks of the specific function of this practice in preparing for charismatic meetings. Quote, Often it is the case that a small group will spend time ahead praying in the Spirit, i.e. in tongues. In doing so, there is greatly multiplied the sense of God's presence and power that carries over into the gathering. And again, quote, we find that quiet praying in the Spirit during that meeting helps to maintain an openness to God's presence. For, after one has become accustomed to praying in tongues aloud, it soon becomes a possibility for one's breath, moving across vocal cords and tongue, to manifest the Spirit's breathing, and thereby for prayer to go on quietly, yet profoundly, within. Williams, page 31. Let us remember also that speaking in tongues can be triggered by such artificial devices as, quote, making sounds with the mouth. And we come to the inevitable conclusion that charismatic speaking in tongues is not a gift at all, but a technique, itself acquired by other techniques, and in turn triggering still other, quote, gifts of the spirit, if one continues to practice and cultivate it. Do we not have here a clue to the chief actual accomplishment of the modern Pentecostal movement, that it has discovered a new mediumistic technique for entering into and preserving a psychic state wherein miraculous, quote, gifts become commonplace? If this is true, then the charismatic definition of the laying on of hands, quote, the simple ministry by one or more persons who themselves are channels of the Holy Spirit to others, not yet so blessed. In which, quote, the important thing is that those who minister have themselves experienced the movement of the Holy Spirit. Williams, page 64. Describes precisely the transference of the mediumistic gift by those who have already acquired it and have themselves become mediums. The quote, baptism of the Holy Spirit thus becomes mediumistic initiation. Indeed, if the charismatic revival is actually a mediumistic movement, much that is unclear about it, if it is viewed as a Christian movement, becomes clear. The movement arises in America, which 50 years before had given birth to Spiritism in a similar psychological climate. A dead, rationalized Protestant faith is suddenly overwhelmed by actual experience of an invisible, quote, power that cannot be rationally or scientifically explained. The movement is most successful in those countries which have a substantial history of spiritism or mediumism. America and England, first of all, then Brazil, Japan, the Philippines, Black Africa. There is scarcely to be found an example of, quote, speaking in tongues in any even nominally Christian context for over 1600 years after the time of St. Paul. And even then it is an isolated and short-lived hysterical phenomenon. Precisely until the 20th century Pentecostal movement, as the scholarly historian of religious, quote, enthusiasm has pointed out, and yet this, quote, gift is possessed by numerous shamans and witch doctors of primitive religions, as well as by modern spiritistic mediums and the demonically possessed. These, quote, prophecies and interpretations at charismatic services, as we shall see, are strangely vague and stereotyped in expression, without specifically Christian or prophetic content. Doctrine is subordinated to practice. The motto of both movements might be, as, quote, charismatic enthusiasts say over and over again, it works. The very trap into which, as we have seen, Hinduism leads its victims. There can scarcely be any doubt that the charismatic revival, as far as its phenomena are concerned, bears a much closer resemblance to spiritism and in general to non-Christian religion than it does to Orthodox Christianity. But we shall have yet to give many examples to demonstrate just how true this is. 
Up to this point we have been quoting, apart from Dr. Koch's statements, only from those favorable to the charismatic revival, who only give their testimonies of what they imagine to be the workings of the Holy Spirit. Now let us quote the testimony of several people who have left the charismatic movement, or refused to enter it, because they found that the spirit that animates it is not the Holy Spirit. Number one, quote, in Leicester, England, a young man reported the following. He and his friend had been believers for some years, when one day they were invited to the meeting of a tongues-speaking group. The atmosphere of the meeting got a hold on them, and afterwards they prayed for the second blessing and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. After intensive prayer, it was as if something hot came over them. They felt very excited inside. For a few weeks, they revealed in this new experience, but slowly these waves of feeling abated. The man who told me this noticed that he had lost all desire to read the Bible and to pray. He examined his experience in the light of the scriptures and realized it was not of God. He repented and denounced it. His friend, on the other hand, continued in these tongues, and it destroyed him. Today he will not even consider the idea of going on further as a Christian. Coke, page 28. Number 2. Two Protestant ministers went to a charismatic, prayer meeting at the Presbyterian Church in Hollywood. Quote, Both of us agreed beforehand that when the first person started to speak in tongues, we would pray roughly the following, Lord, if this gift is from you, bless this brother. But if it is not of you, then stop it and let there be no other praying in tongues in our presence. A young man began the meeting with a short devotion, after which it was open for prayer. A woman started to pray fluently in a foreign language without any stammering or hesitation, and interpretation was not given. The Reverend B and I started to pray quietly as we had agreed earlier. What happened? No one else spoke in tongues, although usually in these meetings all of them, except for an architect, pray in unknown tongues. Coke page 15. Note here that in the absence of the mediumistic solidarity of faith, the phenomena do not appear. Number three, quote, in San Diego, California, a woman came for counseling. She told me of a bad experience that she had had during a mission held by a member of the tongues movement. She had gone to his meetings in which he had spoken about the necessity of the gift of tongues, and in an after meeting she had allowed hands to be laid on herself in order to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the gift of speaking in tongues. At that moment she fell down unconscious. On coming round again she found herself lying on the floor with her mouth still opening and shutting itself automatically without a word being uttered. She was terribly frightened. Standing around her were some of the people who were the followers of this evangelist, and they exclaimed, Oh sister, you have really spoken wonderfully in tongues. Now you have the Holy Spirit. But the victim of this so-called baptism of the Holy Spirit was cured. She never again returned to this group of tongues speakers. When she came to me for advice, she was still suffering from the bad after-effects of this spiritual baptism. Coke, page 26. Number 4. An Orthodox Christian in California relates a private encounter with a, quote, spirit-filled minister who has shared the same platform with the leading Catholic, Protestant, and Pentecostal representatives of the charismatic revival. Quote, for five hours he spoke in tongues and used every artifice, psychological, hypnotic, and laying on of hands, to induce those present to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The scene was really terrible. When he laid hands on our friend she made guttural sounds, moaned, wept, and screamed. He was well pleased by this. He said she was suffering for others, interceding for them. When he laid hands on my head, there was a presentiment of real evil. His tongues were interspersed with English. 
You have the gift of prophecy, I can feel it. Just open your mouth and it will flow out. You are blocking the Holy Spirit. By the grace of God I kept my mouth shut, but I am quite certain that if I had spoken, someone else would have interrupted." End quote. Taken from a private communication. Number five. Readers of the Orthodox Word will recall the account of the, quote, prayer vigil held by the Syrian Antiochian Archdiocese of New York at its convention in Chicago in August 1970, where, after a dramatic and emotional atmosphere that had been built up, young people began to, quote, testify how the spirit was moving them. But several people who were present related later that the atmosphere was, quote, dark and ominous, stifling, dark and evil. And by a miraculous intercession of Saint Herman of Alaska, whose icon was present in the room, the whole meeting was broken up and the evil atmosphere dispelled. The Orthodox Word, Numbers 33 and 34, 1970, pages 196 through 99. There are numerous other cases in which people have lost interest in prayer, reading the scriptures, and Christianity in general, and have even come to believe, as one student did, that, quote, he would not need to read the Bible anymore. God the Father would himself appear and speak to him. Coke, page 29. We shall yet have occasion to quote the testimony of many people who did not find anything negative or evil in their quote charismatic experience, and we shall examine the meaning of their testimony. However, without reaching a conclusion as to the precise nature of the spirit that causes charismatic phenomena, on the basis of the evidence here gathered we can already agree this far with Dr. Koch. Quote, the tongue's movement is the expression of a delirious condition through which a breaking in of demonic powers manifests itself. Koch, page 47. That is, the movement, which is certainly delirious, in giving itself over to the activity of a spirit that is not the Holy Spirit, is not demonic intention or in itself, as contemporary occultism and Satanism certainly are but by its nature it lays itself particularly open to the manifestation of obvious demonic forces, which do in fact sometimes appear. This book has been read by a number of people who have participated in the charismatic revival. Many of them have then abandoned this movement, recognizing that the spirit they have experienced in the charismatic phenomena was not the Holy Spirit. Two such people involved in the charismatic movement, who are now reading this book, we wish to say, you may well feel that your experience in the charismatic movement has been largely something good, even though you may have reservations about some things you have seen or experienced in it. You may well be unable to believe that there is anything demonic in it. In suggesting the charismatic movement is mediumistic in inspiration, we do not mean to deny the whole of your experience while involved in it. If you have been awakened to repentance for your sins, to the realization that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior of mankind, to sincere love for God and your neighbor, all of this is indeed good and would not be lost by abandoning the charismatic movement. But if you think that your experience of speaking in tongues, or prophesying, or whatever else of the supernatural that you may have experienced is from God, then this book is an invitation for you to find out that the realm of true Christian spiritual experience is much deeper than you have felt up to now, that the wiles of the devil are much more subtle than you may have imagined that the willingness of our fallen human nature to mistake illusion for truth, emotional comfort for spiritual experience, is much greater than you think. The next section of this chapter will discuss this in detail. As to the precise nature of the tongues that are being spoken today, probably no simple answer can be given. 
We know quite certainly that in Pentecostalism, just as in Spiritism, the elements of both fraud and suggestion play no small role. Under the sometimes intense pressure it applied in charismatic circles to force the phenomena to appear. Thus, one member of the largely Pentecostal Jesus movement testifies that when he spoke in tongues, quote, it was just an emotional build up thing where I mumbled a bunch of words. And another frankly admits, quote, when I first became a Christian, the people that I was with told me that you had to do it. So I prayed that I could do it, and I went as far as copying off them so they would think that I had the gift. Ortega, page 49. Some of the supposed tongues are thus doubtless not genuine, or at best the product of suggestion under conditions of emotional near hysteria. However, there are actually documented cases of Pentecostal speaking in an unlearned language. Cheryl, page 90 through 95. There is also the testimony of many concerning the ease and assurance and calmness without any hysterical conditions at all, with which they can enter into the state of speaking in tongues. And there is a distinctly preternatural character in the related phenomenon of singing in tongues, where the spirit also inspires the melody and many join in to produce an effect that is variously described as, quote, eerie but extraordinarily beautiful, Cheryl, page 118, and unimaginable, humanly impossible, Williams, page 33. It would therefore seem evident that no merely psychological or emotional explanation can account for much of the phenomena of contemporary, quote, tongues. If it is not due to the working of the Holy Spirit, and by now it is abundantly evident that it could not be so, then today's, quote, speaking in tongues as an authentic supernatural phenomenon can only be the manifestation of a gift of some other spirit. To identify this spirit more precisely, and to understand the charismatic movement more fully, not only in its phenomena, but also in its spirituality, we shall have to draw more deeply from the sources of Orthodox tradition. And first of all, we shall have to return to a teaching of the Orthodox ascetic tradition that has already been discussed in this series of articles, in explanation of the power which Hinduism holds over its devotees, prelest, or spiritual deception. This concludes part 7 of Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future by Father Seraphim Rose. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe, and my social media is in the description. Thank you, and God bless.